Good afternoon, buenas tardes, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual afternoon with Luis Navia to discuss Pure Narco, one man's true story of 25 years in the cartels. Born in Havana in 1955, Luis Navia worked for nearly 25 years as a cocaine trafficker for the deadliest Colombian and Mexican cartels until he was arrested in the multinational takedown operation journey in 2000. He was released in 2005 and began a new career in construction. Today, he also runs his own consulting business for private clients and liaises with the U.S. government in matters related to anti-narcotics law enforcement. He lives in Miami, Florida. To moderate this afternoon's conversation, we're joined by Steve Murphy, a special agent with the Drug Enforcement Administration, who along with his partner, Javier Pena, targeted the world's first narco-terrorist, Pablo Escobar, and the Medellin cartel living and working alongside their Colombian National Police counterparts in Medellin, Colombia, as well as with elite U.S. military units, their efforts resulted in the dismantlement of the largest and most violent international drug trafficking organization of its time. Steve and Javier served as technical consultants for the hit Netflix series Narcos, which is based on their activities in Colombia. In 2019, their book, Manhunters, How We Took Down Pablo Escobar, was released by St. Martin's Press. Throughout this afternoon's podcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of Pure Narco from Books and Books below. We truly appreciate every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now with the Further ado, I would like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello, Luis. Hi, Hello. good afternoon. Welcome, welcome. Thank you, Christina. Honored to be here. Luis, how are you today? Good, Steve. Good. Nice to see you again. Good. I, I hope everybody's listening today thinks this is like the odd couple coming on the screen together. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Uh, but uh, I just want to start off by talking a little bit about uh, your life, your background. I mean, you endure 25 years in one of the most violent and ruthless occupations known to mankind. Uh, I know, you know, you and I, we did our with uh, our partner, Morgan Wright. We did a five hour interview for a podcast yesterday with you. So we not only have we read your book, but we got it firsthand information from you. Uh, I know that you were kidnapped three times, which is just miraculous that you're even here with us today talking. And I happen to know, I happen to know one of those people in Columbia that kidnapped you. And I also know that you're probably the only surviving person that ever survived a kidnapping by him and his organization. So it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's, it's, uh, it's also an honor to be able to, to uh, kind of moderate this little discussion about your new book, Pure Narco. So, uh, and to our viewers, I apologize. I've, I've got a sinus infection. I'll try not to uh, gross anybody out during the talk today. <laughs> so, Luis, if you would, just give us a little brief description of your background, where you grew up, where you went to school, that kind of thing. Well, I was born in Cuba uh, of well-to-do parents. Uh, we came to Miami in 1960 as a result of the uh, Castro Revolution. Uh, my dad never believed in Castro. He, he always, from day one, knew it was a, a bad situation. So uh, we left, you know, somewhat early and came to Key Biscayne. And that's where I grew up. I grew up on Key Biscayne uh, from a, an affluent family, uh, surrounded by very nice people. Um, I went to Belen Jesuit Prep School a very good prep school in Miami. And uh, to this day, uh, we still keep in touch and I keep in touch with the uh, the class of 73. And that's amazing. It's not every day that uh, a bunch of classmates from 50 years ago are still in touch. Um, I grew up on Key Biscayne, an affluent neighborhood in Miami. 
I always had uh, very nice things as uh, growing up. After that, I went to University of Miami. Then I went to Georgetown University. And um, I think I got the best education anybody can get. So really, I'm the last guy that should have gotten involved in this business. I, I can see Chapo or other people that have come from nothing and uh, turn to this business uh, for their economic livelihood. But, you know, I should have uh, been more disciplined and should have taken more advantage of the great opportunity I had at Belen. Should have studied and great, great opportunity of going to great universities. But I, I wasn't wired that way and I wasn't, uh, I think, uh, disciplined enough. And I never really knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to make money, but it's not like all my Belen classmates that, uh, you know, one wanted to be an engineer, an accountant, a doctor. They were, they were set on those paths and they right. were focused, spearheaded their lives in that direction. I didn't know which direction I was going. I knew I wanted to make money and, and that's not good. You should be, you should, you should have solid foundations of, you know, where you want to go. Well, it's, the, it's very encouraging to hear team, you say yeah. that. It's very encouraging to hear you say that as well. Uh, and as I recall from our discussion <laughs> yesterday, um, you started dabbling a little bit in Coke when you were in uh, Georgetown, right? That's kind of your introduction into the drug business. Yes. Um, we, I was more of a, a, on a party mode with my friends from South America and this and that in Georgetown. And um, somehow the other, somebody called me from Miami and asked me if I could, uh, you know, move some product up there. Back then it was nothing. It was nine, 12, uh, you know, ounces. But still, in 1975, it was, you know, something. And I did it a few times. And then uh, I started to send some of the, you know, ounces up to Boston. But, you know, that was just money uh, like wham, walking around money. You make Spend three, four thousand dollars. That's a lot of money when you're in college. Mm -hmm. But never did I think, hey, this is a great business. I'm going to stay in the drug business because I'm making four thousand uh, dollars. I always understood that, uh, you know, money, you know, what real money was and what like walking around money is. So uh, it's not that I started dealing in Georgetown and then I went back to Miami. I said, I want to continue in the drug business. No, after mm -hmm. I left Georgetown, I worked in the insurance business, but true to my nature, and it, this has always been something about me, I always try to take it to the limit. So when I started selling insurance, instead of going door to door, you know, selling $10,000 policies, I always shot, you know, a million dollar policies. I was always aiming towards uh, the stars and hoping to mm -hmm. hit the moon. So yeah. I always took things to the higher limits, let's say. Right. Which is kind of uh, true of your your drug business because you went from just moving a few ounces at Georgetown to finally the last act being arrested in Venezuela during the movement of 25 tons of cocaine. Is that correct? Yes. The seizure was 25 tons. I, I, you know, so we know your, your career, that career spanned 25 years. But holy cow, the numbers, the, the stories you told us yesterday, uh, the amounts of, of drugs that were being moved, you know, and, and one thing we noticed that uh, during your interview, uh, you never referred to it as cocaine. You always referred to it as product. So is, is that indicative no. of the business? Um, in my case, uh, it's a commodity and I just, I never planned this. This, this suddenly happened. I got involved. And I got involved at the highest levels from day one. So I never looked back at it as something I planned. It was just one day to the next. And then I started realizing and, and dealing with it as a business, a, a real business. And uh, it had a business model. And I always wanted mm -hmm. to grow so and expand. So I always uh, expanded my sales force in the United States, my distribution networks. And later on, I said, the next step is actually go down to Colombia, open an office in Colombia, open an export office. And then instead of just dealing in the U.S. from Colombia, I could go to Mexico, Belize, Jamaica, Europe. We mm -hmm. never hit Asia, unfortunately. 
<laughs> That's not remorse I'm hearing, is it? <laughs> no, I mean, it, uh, I mean, if you look at it as a business model, you know, a bait, you know, you know, Steve, that I, I feel that this should be legalized. It's the only way to really win this war on drugs. That's, that's a hard pill to swallow because it's easy to say legalize it, but it takes a lot, you know, and, and, and cocaine is a very bad drug. So, you know, it's you just can't say let's legalize it because it's a very bad, dangerous drug. I would advise anybody to stay away from it. Great. As, and, and, as a drug and as a business, I would not you know, advise anybody to get into this. Uh, th my, my case was just an off the wall situation. It's a miracle. Right. I, I don't even know how it happened. But no, um, and, and, and so during our interview yesterday, and, and I hate to keep referring back to that, to everyone. And, and I'll just tell you, it's it will be released Monday and Thursday of next week. The podcast is called Game of Crimes. Uh, you'll hear Luis for over four hours tell his story, and it gets very detailed. We had a lot of fun talking about it, um, but it was very eye-opening for me because I had the, the uh, I'm going to say, the honor and pleasure of working a case that resulted in the capture of Pablo Escobar in Colombia, living in, and working in Colombia for several years with my partner, Javier Pena. And so when I was reading your book before we did the interview and then during the interview yesterday, we have a lot of common... I'm not going to call them friends, but a lot of common contacts, for example, acquaintances. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, Kiko Moncada and Fernando Galeano, that's the two gentlemen that uh, Pablo killed in prison, which ultimately led to his escape from, from La Theater Isle. Uh, talking about Rascuño, who had kidnapped you at one point. He was the head of the North Valley cartel, Mickey Ramirez. I mean, it was just so many names. It was like a walk down memory lane. Uh, you know, and, and I know a lot of people are probably looking at us like we're crazy right now. You know, that that we're smiling about it. We're kind of reminiscing about it. But it was part of our lives, you know. And, and what I really like about you, Luis, is when the time came, you met two federal agents, uh, Eric Kolbinski with the DEA and Bob Harley with the uh, Custom Service, which is now HSI or ICE, who uh, Bob indicted you, right? He indicted me, yes. In, and that uh, was for, for, for 4,600 kilos of cocaine, if I'm correct. Yes, 4,600 into the Keys, Florida Keys. And so you've, <laughs> I love this story. You found out about it. You knew there was an indictment in the United States. So you moved to another country, correct? Uh, yes. And I moved before that indictment because actually there was a takedown in Tucson, Arizona. They arrested 135 people. Back then we were working with the Guadalajara cartel with Caro Quintero and um, they got busted in Tucson. And I, I thought for sure the guy in Tucson was going to spill my name. So I left in 88 and that's when I opened up the export office in Colombia. And um that's when we started working very, very strongly with uh, Miki Ramirez, which you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we got stories about him that, that are nuts. Yeah. Fernando Galeano, which was uh, Pablo's, one of Pablo's main uh, partners. Um, we started working with him. Uh, as a matter of fact, with Fernando, we, we were hitting a lighthouse off Tampa mm -hmm. that Bob Harley got a whiff of. And... Um, after a while, he realized that there was so much cocaine coming into South Florida or, you know, through the West Coast mm -hmm. that he called it uh, the Coke machine. He called that lighthouse the Coke machine. That's, but that's the numbers were just, yeah, they were just wild. But th that I was able to do that because of the people I was working with, like Fernando Galeano. They all had the money to supply the equipment, the right. product, and the organization. And then I had the logistics. So, so and, and here's your book. This is what we're talking about today, Pure Narco. And you can see we did our research before we did an interview. I've, I've got about a thousand tabs in there, things I wanted to ask you about. But there's one thing in particular you explained to Morgan and I yesterday. Uh, there's some great photographs in this book. But this one on the back, and you know which one oh, I'm talking Jesus. about. Yeah. Tell <laughs> us a little bit about that picture right there. That's a hilarious story. Well, I, I was in Cuba, and I was in Cuba as a Colombian. And back then, we didn't have many places we could go to because we all felt we were indicted and Cuba was the only place that didn't care. And, you know, we went in there and took a vacation in Cuba. Believe me, I didn't want to go to Cuba because uh, I still had my hard feelings about uh, 
the way that island has been run and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. My dad would be turning over in his grave uh, if he knew I went to Cuba. Well, so uh, so I, I go and I go to, to this yacht club or whatever, and they have this uh, setup with uh, an African dictator and uh, like a guy dressed like a Arabian emir. Mm -hmm. And I said, and the guy in the middle, you know, is, is me. Uh, with the captain's at and there's like a 200 foot yacht in the back and i said this is perfect this is perfect so i set it up i'm um, um, took the picture said i'm gonna send this to barb harley <laughs> just to mess with him you know yeah. i mean what kind of mind you know this guy bob harley's a serious man working for customs he's indicted you on 4600 kilos and you're sending him postcards just to mess with him so in the back i said bob dollar per dollar dictators and emir are the best bang for your buck <laughs> saludos meyer because i always used to use you jewish last names for you know aliases and stuff like that and uh i mean i can imagine i used to send them bow ties for christmas you know what we call that we call that, we call that poking the bear in the cage yeah you know, you're antagonizing bob, him a little bit and bob harley is is, is an amazing person and he's got such a sense of humor so i guess he took it in stride he wasn't too happy when you first met me yeah you know yeah. he he uh, he had a different impression of me uh, you know he thought you know here is this, this guy that uh, i know for a fact has been moving a lot of product and is working with pablo and fernando galliano rasguño ivan urdinola i mean all the all those characters in narcos you know mm -hmm. that you did Absolutely. Those were those were my friends. Those who that's who I worked with, and uh, he must have thought I was, uh, you know, the living devil. But then he met me, and you know, we started to get to know each other, and uh, things got worked out and smooth. And today he's my friend. He, you know, I enjoy his company, and every once in a while we we go to lunch or dinner, and as oh. as I do with Eric, the guy who brought me back on the uh, C one thirty for Venezuela. Yeah, so um, we were uh, we were doing the intro and outro for your podcast today. Morgan and I were, and we clarified one point. Now, and our and the listeners today may be wondering, you know, you said you were only indicted under forty six hundred kilos of coke, but in Venezuela they had seized twenty five tons, which you guys were in the process of moving. And why weren't you indicted on that? Well, if I'm understanding this correctly, it's because all of that cocaine was destined for Europe, not the United States, right? Uh, yes and no, because um, my my other partner was indicted. The thing is that uh, I was uh, in Europe and I was handling all the shipping, uh, the shipping part of the operation. And when I went to Venezuela, the organization in Venezuela already had a, a guy infiltrated by law enforcement. So mm -hmm. we were compromised. But this guy didn't know who I was. And all he knew that there was a Greek guy coming from uh, Europe to Venezuela. Mm -hmm. The Greek, the Greek, the Greek. Well, actually, I showed up in Venezuela as a Mexican. So when they were doing their surveillance, I says, who is this guy? Who is this guy? Well, he's not Greek. He doesn't look Mexican. So they had to take the prints off a glass in a restaurant. We were at a restaurant, and after we left the restaurant, they took the, the prints from the glass. They sent it to Bob Harley. Uh, they, they didn't send it to Bob Harley. They, they just sent it to Miami. And then when they found out it was Louis Navia by protocol, they had to reach out to Bob Harley because he had my indictment. Right. So um, they didn't have enough time to indict me on that. I mean, um, they, they could have, but they already had their case already set up. And uh, Bob told them, you got to bring him in. Because I've, I've lost them twice. I lost them in Cancun. I lost them in Panama. They wanted to give me a little more rope. And mm -hmm. uh, they said, no, bring them in. And then they, they clamped down on the whole operation and, you know, knocked it down. And, so, and but, you were already facing, what was, the, tell, the, tell the listeners what you were facing as far as uh, punishment time. Well, I was at the highest level because I, I was categorized not only for the volume of drugs, but as a leader organizer and when mm -hmm. they they clip you with leader organizer that's like an extra 10 12 15 years so i, I was looking at level 
uh, at life. I was looking at 35 to life. And, you know, that's a, that's a hard pill to swallow, let me tell you. That, uh, well, that's a number on you. And when you're already looking at life, you know, why complicate the, the investigation further by adding 25 tons on it? Because you're already looking at life. You know, I mean, they can only get one life out of you, right? Um, right. But, but now that's not the way things turned out, is it? No, I, I had no idea how the criminal justice system worked with, uh, you know, the levels and the sentencing guidelines. And uh, if you have one indictment and it's 20, whatever amount, more than 150 kilos, you're dead anyway. You know, it could be a right. thousand or 150. But when you have two indictments, then it gets real tough to start working down your your numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank God they didn't indict me on that uh, Venezuela because I would have come in with two indictments. Then it would have been really tough to get under 15, 17, 20 years. And uh, with one indictment and uh, with Bob taking away the leadership role, and, and it took you know, two years for him to take away the leadership role or you know, a year and a half. But he finally did. He finally did because uh, he realized that on that one indictment from the Keys, on that one indictment, I was not a leader. My partner was. And I told him that, Bob, I'll be honest with you. On My whole life, I've been a leader and an organizer. But on that one indictment you got me on, my name was number two on the list. You know, it was not the number one name on the list because those people in the keys didn't know me they knew of me because my partner gave them my name right my mistake so he said you know you're right lewis and but that's because he liked me and i uh you know i played ball and i was a, a decent person because believe me i would have been a you know a real idiot about it and would have come across with an attitude mm -hmm. oh he, he he didn't have to take that he said i don't care what it sticks and it's on and you're going to do it. But he, he said to me, Lewis, I'm going to give you a chance. You know, I'm going to give you a chance to get back to Key Biscayne, sell hot dogs in Crandon Park and see your kids. That's exactly what he said to me. Yeah. And, you know, and I owe my life to, to Bob Harley. You do. You do. He's uh, yeah. he's a heck mm -hmm. of an investigator. And, and uh, now, so, you know, you just alluded to the fact that you cooperate with the government, right? Oh, yes. So that had a lot to do with bringing your time down and, and developing that relationship with Bob and Eric and, uh, you know, an atmosphere of trust and so forth. But now before you could plead guilty and cooperate, you had to take some steps, didn't you? You had to get some authorizations from people um, because and when you just tell us the story rather than me beating around the bush here. Well, you know, here I am in Miami. I'm looking at life. You know, I um, call my wife. And I tell her, listen, this is the situation. And I need you to go down to Colombia. I need you to talk to Rasguño. I need you to talk to Mickey, uh, at least whoever you can find, because everybody by that time was already running for the hills. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't know this, but in 1998, uh, the Colombians uh, had s set up meetings with the DEA in Panama, and they already started to open the door of cooperation. There was always uh, already an air of cooperation. I didn't know this, but um, my wife went down to Columbia. She contacted Mickey, Roz, and certain other people. Mm -hmm. And they told them, they told her, listen, you don't have to worry about your life or, or your or the lives of your daughter and your son because they lived in Mexico. Remember, they didn't live in the U.S. So they were open. They were, they were game for any kind of problem. You know, have Lewis do whatever he can to get out of this mess. You know, we're all going to have to do it also. I mean, they know everything, so it's not like they're, he's going to tell them anything he, they don't already know. And now we just got to cut our losses. So, uh, you know, he's, he's free to do whatever he needs to do. He's on his own. You don't have to worry. Your kids don't have to worry. Then she asked him, well, how about the $7 million that they owe him? Do you owe him? I said, no, <laughs> that's off the table. <laughs> you know, you know, he, he, he can talk and he can work his way, way out of whatever he needs to work out of. But the $7 million are definitely off the table and you can't have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, that's pretty gutsy to ask that, I have to say. Well, I had to ask, you know.
<laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's seven million. And so, because of that air of cooperation with the government, and and this was amazing when we found this out from yesterday. So you went through a number of debriefings before you were sentenced, right? How long did those debriefings last? About 13 months. That's just outrageous. That's yeah. the longest I think I've ever heard. And I was, I was in law enforcement for 38 years. I was with DEA for 26. I think that's the longest debriefing period I've ever heard in my life. But it's because you had contacts throughout the world. And mm -hmm. I remember you telling us what you guys had planned for Africa. Uh, can you enlighten us on that a little bit? Well, um, we were using freighters to cross the Atlantic. You know, the paper trail was just uh, a mess. Uh, you know, it, I mean, when they arrested me, I had four packs of Xanax in my pocket. I, I was just, <laughs> you know, anxiety to the max because I was handling too much. But we figured, you know what, let's save on transport, save on on a lot of, uh, you know, uh, freighters you know 14 freighters moving around the world that's a logistics nightmare so we we were going to set up uh, plantations uh coca plantations in africa now which created, you, uh, go ahead i'm yeah, sorry well when the french and the italians and they heard that they freaked out totally really now that i think about it that would have been a complete cluster you know what because mm -hmm. you know what it is to put coca plantations in the hands of paramilitary African groups that are now like totally off the wall. It would have been a disaster. It would have Absolutely. been a bloodbath because in the end, one group would have tried to screw the other group. It would have been a complete disaster. Right. But uh, we did plan on that and that's why it took so long and the the french came the british came the italians came the russian everybody came to talk to me and it took a long time and plus every other agency in the u.s i guess i don't know well everybody's interested I, and that was that was i mean that was like sending up flares around the world you know the fact that i mean we all know that colombia bolivia and peru are the three leading countries for the production of coca plants and cocaine hydrochloride and then all of a sudden introducing that into the continent of africa where you have so many lawless areas and outlaw mm -hmm. groups over there i mean red flares are going up around the world that was just and, and that's why you became so popular in the law enforcement community as well as the intelligence community so i spoke um, to people i didn't even know where they were from because they had clearance that they didn't my attorney told me they don't have to tell you these guys they have the uh, you know i didn't know their i didn't even know what agency they worked for but mm -hmm. you know i spoke to them right so i guess those are the uh the spooks <laughs> so <laughs> as you guys refer to them but yeah, um, well, we, we call them other things as well but uh, we won't on the show today um uh, so interesting but, though let me ask you, after everything you've been through, and now you're, you're leading a model life, uh, you started a company, a successful company. Why did you decide to write Pure Narco? The one that um, first talked to me about that was Bob Harley. Hmm. Because remember, to indict me, he started, a lot of people were arrested in the U.S. Then he started to interview all these people. And then he came across my name because everybody he interviewed he debriefed it, Louis. Not where were you getting your Louis Navi? Louis Navi? Louis Navi? So he was hearing Louis Navi from a bunch of people, and everybody he met wanted to write a book. So then finally, when he met me, he he said to me, "You know, I've, I've been talking to people for years, and everybody wants to write a book, but now I realize that the one that should write the book is you, because <laughs> these guys were only five minutes of your life. So you should but be the one." Really to write but yeah. there were so many of them. I mean, this is, this is not a, uh, that's not a 200 page book. You can see how thick it is. That's, that's a history book almost there. And, and it's the cool thing about it. Maybe it's because I've spent time in Colombia and love that country. Um, it was like a history book. It was like a walk down memory lane for me, but now you're, you're, you teamed up with an author named Jesse Fink. How'd that come about? Um, he came to Miami to interview um, a girl that uh, was friends with Bon Scott. And I know her also. So um, 
after he interviews her, uh, she says, I'd like you to talk to a friend of mine who has a pretty interesting life and a pretty interesting story to tell. So when Jesse and I started talking, this guy thought this was all fiction. And he, and, and he tells me, you know, I don't do fiction. I said, well, this isn't fiction. He says, well, it certainly sounds like it. He says, well, it isn't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he started doing the research and research and research and talking to law enforcement officers and agencies in Europe. And finally, uh, he realized this was real. So he took on the job. And before that, I had talked to certain authors and they couldn't put it together. Uh, it's not easy to put 25 years together. It takes a certain kind of writer to be able to do that. And Jesse was able to do it. Jesse's very organized. He really took a liking to the story. He got involved. He, he, he really got involved with me, you know, in, in this whole thing. And uh, he was in Australia. I'm, I'm in Miami. The time differences were, you know, off the wall. Right. So um, we did two and a half years of uh, phone interviews. And then he came to Miami. Yeah, no, it was crazy. Well, and, and, and he talks about it in the book. And then, you know, the three of us have talked a little bit offline about this as well. You guys hit it off right off the bat, didn't you? You saw eye to eye on everything. Not really. Yeah, not so much. I mean, not really. Uh, even the title of the book, you know, I, I wanted to call it Smuggler's Journey. Um, okay, decent. Okay, then uh, In the Belly of the Beast. Then they came up with this pure narco. And I go, are you nuts? You think I'm going to pure narco? I, that's a hard pill to swallow. And they said, no, it's got to be because really you are a pure narco. Forget about the bad connotations of the word, which it does. It does have tremendously bad connotations. But when you Google it, narco means um, a person involved in contraband, mm -hmm. uh, a person that smuggles, um, you know, illegal goods. It doesn't talk about killing. It doesn't talk about, you know, paramilitaries. It doesn't talk about kidnappings. You were a pure smuggler. That's what you were. I said, yeah, right. it's true. So random, Penguin Random House, and Jesse, they convinced me, let's go with it. It's got a catchy name. But I didn't want to. And uh, But in the end, I said, okay. And, yeah. and they said, you know, you, you got to have some hard skin to, to go with it. But we went with it. That's the story behind Pure Narco. Right. And, and I want to ask you also, um, just tell the listeners, how many acts of violence were you involved with? What kind of weapons did you carry? Did you were you involved in explosives? Just tell us that part of your story. No, I, I never carried weapons. Never, never. I, I, I never liked guns. Um, my, my mindset was never, you know, into guns. I didn't know how to use them. And I was around a lot of people that did carry guns and I certainly knew that they knew how to use them. So I knew that, you know, there's no reason for me to, to, to get involved in guns and that's not my nature. You know, um, I'm a person, uh, I, I'm very humorous. I'm a funny guy. I've got a nice personality and, uh, I'm better off using that than guns. I, I just didn't see the, and I knew that, the organizations I worked for definitely used guns, no doubt about it. Right. I never got involved in that aspect of the business. My thing was logistics. And even they used to tell me, don't even get involved. If there's a problem, we'll deal with it. But I, I, I didn't like to carry guns. Uh, I didn't like guns. I didn't like having guns around. and I just never liked them. So yeah. I was totally nonviolent in that sense. I'm, you know, I, I would not you know, have someone killed for money or for anything. Uh, you know, that's not, that was not my business model. Uh, so, my business model was taking stuff from point A to point Z. And I forgave you, a lot of people that owed me money. Yeah. And, and the office used to say, you want us to go after him? I said, no. How much does he owe? A million eight, four, 4.6. I've had to deal with some, some, some bills and I used to pay. I used to pay. I said, I don't. So would you attribute that as to one of the reasons you were able to survive 25 years in the most violent business on earth? Yeah, definitely. That saved me. For example, with the uh, kidnapping with Rasguño, you know, he told my wife, the only reason I'm letting him go is because I know he's a nonviolent, non vindictive person. He'll go out and make 30 million tomorrow. He may blow it. 
but he's never going to use one cent to come after me. He's right. not violent. He's not vindictive. He's nuts because they always used to tell me, you're nuts. And, and, the, and then I used to tell, well, you must be crazier than I am because for you to work with me, then you got to be crazier than I am. Yeah. You know, we used to crack jokes all the time. These guys were, you know, they were actually my friends. Uh, you know, we, we had a very, uh, it was not a conflictive relationship. They were always happy to see me. They they loved you know hanging out with me because I was like, you know, uh, a breath of fresh air to them. They they lead such violent, uh, right. you know, complicated lives that they'd have me over and we'd be bsing about a bunch of other things that had nothing to do with uh, the daily uh, mess they they ha would have to deal with every day. So right. yeah, uh, being authentic. Um, I kept my authenticity. I never, if I would have come across as a violent person and not be a violent person and try to fake it out, these guys are the alpha predators. They, yeah. They'll smell it out. And that's what they hate, somebody that's not authentic. And they knew I was authentic. I, they knew I, I was who I was. And uh, that saved me big time. Right. Well, we're starting to get some questions in now from listeners. And, and uh, let's just address a couple of these right now. And this is a uh, this is a pretty deep question for you. Did you ever struggle with the moral implications of the business you were involved with? No. So, so knowing that you know cocaine is poison. I mean, you told us yourself it's poison. Do you ever have any moral issues with that? No, because you know that's not up to me. That's up to the government. You know they make it illegal, and they're smarter than I am. They know that they can get rid of this problem by making it legal because. You know, liquor, there was a lot of criminality when liquor was illegal and people were getting killed and bad liquor was getting sold. They legalized it and it went away. Um, I treated it as a product and there's no way I could have been thinking about the morality of what happens. You know, I used to snort myself, so I probably lived because I snorted, you know, product that was good. It didn't have fentanyl. But the morality, no. How can I deal with the morality of that for 25 years? I felt I was just transporting a product. And uh, at that point, and it still is illegal, but, you know, someday it will be legal. Um, you know, it's that's the truth. You know, I'm not going to lie to you. You know, that it's bad, that what I did is bad. Yeah, it is bad. No doubt about it. No, it's... Uh, I didn't deal with the morality because uh, I, I didn't, you know, I was too preoccupied and I liked my business. Mm -hmm. You know, I liked it. I treated it as a commodities business and I expanded it with that mentality as if it was legal. Right. But I did it. I did an illegal business in an honest way. Okay. The morality, I'm not going to kill anybody. I won't do that because my morals don't allow me to kill somebody now collateral damage and people died because of the product you know you know how many people die from alcohol uh, or you know oxycontin you know i don't want it's it's a cheap comparison but it's real so no the morality part that was not me that's the maybe the government should think about that right and i'll just i'll just say the, the reason that uh, you and i have become friends we had you on the podcast and why I'm here with you today is because I believe you are telling the truth. Um, you know, Thank Morgan you. and I both, if we felt differently, this wouldn't be going on. So, uh, and just so that if anybody's wondered about what I think about it, I'm complete opposite of, of what you say, Louise. I'm not in favor of legalization, but you can probably figure that out from my law enforcement background, right? So that's a topic for Correct. another day. And I respect that. And I tell you, legalization exactly. is not easy and, you know, and it's dangerous. It's so, very you know, it's very, very dangerous. That's that's a hot topic we could go off on, and, and uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to go there today. <laughs> um, no. Next question. How long did it take you to work on the book? Well, um, all through my prison years, you know, I wrote. Those are the, uh, I played drums, I worked out, I read, and I wrote. So it was five years, and then two and a half with Jesse, seven and a half. You know, so eight years. And then, and then after two and a half with, years with Jesse, did it take it a while to finally get it published? 
No, we had an offer from, uh, um, and, and, and Jesse started to write it because we, we had an initial offer interest from um, ra uh, random uh, Penguin Random House. Oh, nice. Yeah, no, no, they they hopped on right away. When Jesse uh, gave them the pitch, I, I got a guy in Miami, but the, time, the whole thing, they, no, we're on. And they, they, they gave us a contract right away. Very good. So, but still, yeah. but still you, you know, you think about seven and a half years to finally get to this point where you have that book. And it's, I mean, it's just now coming out in the United States. It's already in print in other countries, correct? Yes. It uh, came out in Australia first, uh, England, um, and now the U.S. Yesterday, it came out in the U.S. in hardcover. Very good. Very good. Uh, next question is, and this is a little deep also. As you reflect on, as you reflect on your life's experiences, do you have a philosophy of life to share? What are what are your takeaways from all this? My philosophy of life is be authentic. Um, you know, educate yourself. Take advantage of uh, the opportunities of education. That's that's what's going to make you a better person. And that's going to uh, be with you all your life. Philosophy is life is, you know, just, you know, don't hurt anybody. And um, just educate yourself and try to make this world a, a better place through, you know, uh, being a better person and uh, doing the right thing. I don't know, maybe what I did... Uh, I did it in a way that, uh, yeah, I did hurt a lot of people, but in the end, you know, I did it in the cleanest way I knew. So just stay authentic to your to to your values and don't kid yourself. You know, don't uh, the worst lie you can do is lie to yourself. Know who you are. And those, you know, you were well, philosophy you, of life. <laughs> we talked about at the beginning about you know you you came from an affluent family. Your father was extremely successful in business and the in the sugarcane business, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there were were a lot of lessons you learned from him as far as business, as far as how to treat people, uh, things to look out for, pitfalls, that kind of thing. And then you were you were given the opportunity to go, you know, go Canes. I'm I'm a Miami Hurricane fan myself. Uh, in Georgetown, where you you learned excellent business practices, you got the education, and then all these years later, you started your own company and it's successful. So if you had, and this is not a question from the audience, this is a question for me, if you had it to, to do over again, you know, would you go into legitimate business? I mean, you were, you were buying some businesses, you bought a, a macadamia farm in Costa Rica, you bought the uh, sugar cane, uh, all those acres here in Florida. Um, what do you think? I mean, the money is a massive amount of money you went through in that 25 years, but looking at the legal side, what do you think? Look, the person I am today is not the person I was when I was 23 years old. And when I was 23 years old, 22 years old, 20 years old that I started this, you know, uh, I was not well focused and I wasn't uh, well established in what I wanted to do in life. And um, um, I, 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 I'm going to tell you if, if I had to do it again, I, uh, like I said, I wouldn't do it. I would uh, start my legal business. If I would have started my legal business back when I was 25 years old today, I'd be much better off than I am now. Right. But would I have done it? No, because 25, don't, uh, you know, 40 years ago, I was a very immature and I didn't know which way I was going. And I was not the same person I am today. Right. So, but if I had to give advice, uh, this is a great country. You work hard. Nobody's going to take the money from you. You can, you know, do whatever you want in life and be very successful in this country. This country gives you all the opportunities you can. And uh, if I would have been in the construction business from, you know, 40 years ago today, I'd be more than retired and I'd be a lot better off. If I would have stayed in the insurance business, <laughs> I would have been a lot better off than I am now. Um you know, and retired. I did things backwards. You know, I started working when I was uh, 50. Working 
in the le legitimate business. And, right. you know, I've gone through a lot and I'm under a lot of stress and it's not easy to work construction in Miami, right. but uh, it is what it is. And uh, I've been giving, given another chance and the best thing in life is uh, being able to share with your kids and uh, leave them, yeah, leave them a, a good image of who you are. And that's you something know, I got to work on. Um, and, and a lot of people, uh, you know, on the, on the pot, this is a little bit off topic, but it's still related to you directly. A lot of people talk about Pablo Escobar that, you know, he, he did, he introduced a business model in the cocaine trafficking manufacturing distribution business that made him responsible for 80% of the world's cocaine, believe it or not. That's absolutely true. People say, well, if he'd applied those business practices to a legitimate business, he would have been equally successful. I mean, you know, it, Forbes magazine estimated his net worth at between eight and thirty billion dollars. And Javier and I don't agree with that simply because his business model employed violence. He asked you to do something. He told you to do something. If you didn't do it, he killed you. He not only killed you, but he killed your family, he killed your parents, your children, he even killed your pets. So you know, mm -hmm. that's not going to work in a legitimate business, whereas you avoided violence your entire 25 years. You know, you you've. Um, seen the light, I guess would be a nice way to say it, you know, and you realized uh, your wrongs. You People are probably wondering, what the heck is Steve Murphy doing on here talking to Louise Navia? You know, 38 years as a cop, 25 years as a drug trafficker. It's because I believe in our criminal justice system here in the United States. You paid your debt to society, and that's what we ask happens. That's what the punitive side of, of justice system is. So there's no reason. The fact that you are friends with Bob Harley and Eric Kolbinski, Eric's a very good friend of mine. We were stationed in Miami together back in the 80s. And when Eric vouched for you, that was good enough for me. So that's why we're here today. Um, there's And there's more questions starting to come in here. One is, uh, for me, it says, can you tell us a little bit about working on the Netflix series? Um, I don't want to spend time on that today because we're here to talk about Pure Mar Narco. I will give a little plug for our, our podcast, Game of Crimes. If you go back and, and look, the very first episode is, is my co-host interviewing Javier Pena and I about our investigation in Narcos. So you'll learn everything you want to hear there. And that's a nasty little plug for our podcast. So sorry, had to get that in. But here's your next question. Uh, and uh, actually, there's a name attached to it, but I'm not going to read it on here. From one of your 1973 friends, you missed quality years with your family. What are your thoughts about that? And then they end up by saying, see you in Tuscany. Okay. That's very good. The biggest crime, well, the biggest crime I committed, I think, was uh, continuing to work after my daughter was born. That's one thing that I blame. My, that's crazy. Um, I should have quit the minute my daughter was born because you should not put your kids through that kind of danger and through uh, that situation. And um, I didn't see my kids for six years and um, that was very hard. But then again, because of the, you know, I was saved by the US government. I was able to see them at, uh, before they became, uh, you know, teenagers. I was mm -hmm. still able to see them at, at a younger age, but uh, that hurts when you can't see your kids. Right. And, um, um, there's a lot of things you miss out on, you know, and, and when you lead that lifestyle, you're, you're on another tangent and then you lose touch with reality. You, you, you become, you think you're a, a non-citizen that, uh, lo laws of the world don't apply to you, that you can do whatever you want, whenever you want it. And, uh, you le lose, uh, you know, the essence of, uh, reality of what the world is. And thank, thank God you know, as soon as I was arrested, you know, I was able to snap back. Right. And uh, get rid of that, you know, attitude and uh, land on uh, the the real platform of what, uh, of what, you know, life is. But um, you lose touch with reality when you're in that world. And uh, me not uh, quitting when my daughter was born, that shows you how crazy I was because how, how can you put your kids through something like that? That's right. that's a big crime. 
I, that's right. the, the biggest crime I committed was that. You know, and and from the other side of the aisle, aisle talking about this, um, I'm guilty of some of the same things that you went through because we put the job first rather than our families. Mm -hmm. uh, it's amazing. After I retired from DEA, my, and I have four children, how they would tell me, "Oh yeah, Dad, you missed this and you missed that." And you think back, and I thought, "Well, I thought I did a pretty good job of, you know, making it to the volleyball games and the soccer games and and the different sports and the different activities that your children are involved with." But to hear your children lay that out to you, it's it's uh, it tears your heart out, you know. So it's I'm equally as guilty of, of not focusing on my family like you did, and I think that's true of, of most guys in law enforcement. And when I say guys, that's that's men and women. That's just a Southern thing I say. So uh, it's tough. It's tough on the families and it takes a special family to put up with our crap, to be honest with you. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll just say this, for example, my kids never knew what I did, never knew what I did because they were young. And when I went to prison, my kids did not know I was in prison. They just thought I had a, a, a visa problem and I couldn't get down to Mexico. Hmm. But they were they were kids. They were three, four, five, six, seven years old. OK, mm -hmm. now it came up to a time that I was out of prison. They were living with me on Key Biscayne. And I was saying to myself, you know, I don't want my kids to think, well, why was dad not around for six years? Right. Was he out like just partying in Europe and partying in Europe was more important than being with us. So before they ever thought that I. I I sat them down. They were, my son was uh, 11. My daughter was 14. I said, listen, the reason I was not around for those six years is because I was in prison because, you know, that's the only thing that would keep me from not being next to you guys is not being able to, because I'm behind bars. And I had to tell them the truth. And I'm glad I told them the truth because I'd, I'd hate for them to have to, to, to think uh, that my dad's not with me because he doesn't like me. Or right. there's other better things in life than us. Right, right. So. And you can't lie to your children. No. Hey, so we, we've got another question from somebody you and I both know. Um, you know him a little bit better than I do, a guy named Jesse Fink. You ever heard of him? <laughs> Jesse uh, Fink? Yeah. yeah. I, guess, I guess he's sending us in from Australia. His question is, what do, you both, what do both of you think of the depiction of major drug traffickers, such as Pablo Escobar and Alberto Cecilia Falcon, on screen? Are they accurate? Uh, you want to go first or you want me to? I'll go. I mean, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's it's accurate. Pablo, you know, he he was um, the, the major figure in the uh, Medellin cartel. It's true. He At one point, he controlled 80 percent of the uh, um, the market, violent. I would say they depicted him, very, uh, you know, very accurately and in. in in the uh, series and um, Alberto Cecilia Falcone, uh, I knew him personally, but the series uh, made a, I don't know if they did it on purpose or not, but in the series he gets killed and he was not killed uh, as they depicted it in the series. Cause you know, I was with him in 90, uh, 96, 97, 98. And supposedly they killed him in Tijuana back in the eighties or whatever. Um, and Alberto Cecilia Falcón was Cuban, and he had a CIA background, and mm -hmm. he was actually one of the first ones to start the uh, uh, Mexican cartels. He was probably one of the biggest figures in the Mexican cartels, like Amado Carrillo, El Chapo. All these guys were like uh, low-level employees when Alberto Cecilia Falcón was already uh, a capo and already had right. 20 $30 million in Europe. I know that for a fact. Right. And uh, a hell of a guy. Uh, a very elegant, very elegant. Uh, he, he Cuban. Cuban guy. Good looking Cuban guy. And uh, had a lot of style. And he he was very powerful in Mexico. Uh, so from my point of view, um, and I never worked against Falcon, so I, I, I'll stay away from that. Um, on screen... And a few people know this. Um, when we were, when Javier and I were first approached about telling our story about Pablo Escobar and the Medellin cartel, which resulted in the first two seasons of Narcos, 
we turned them down. We turned Netflix down. Uh, the creator of Narcos is a producer, executive producer named Eric Newman. Uh, I'm sure he probably fell out of his chair uh, when we told him no, because we've since learned in Hollywood, a lot of people will sell their souls to be on television. And that's what we were never about. You know, so he flew to Washington. I met with him and we kind of hit it off. But his his question after dinner one evening was, why are you and Javier so hesitant to tell your stories? And I was just really honest with him. I told him the last thing we want is anybody would try and glorify a mass murderer like Pablo Escobar. And at that that evening, right then, Eric said, I promise you that will never happen in our series. We will never glorify the drug traffickers. And to our, in our opinion, he's lived up to his word all these years later. I mean, he's, he's become an extremely good friend for both of us. He's introduced us to, to other things uh, in the entertainment world. But when you look at the, uh, the narco series where you're talking about Pablo, the quality of the actor has a lot to do with portraying the reality of the situation. So they brought in a Brazilian named uh, Wagner Mora, who couldn't even speak Spanish. But if you watch him on the series, he sounds like he's fluent in Spanish. He was so dedicated to his role, he moved to Medellin three months before filming started and, and immersed himself in the uh, not only the Spanish language, but the, the Paisa accents that go along with Medellin and Antioquia, which is that part of, of uh, Colombia. Even in season two, if you remember the scene where they show Pablo is hiding out on his father's farm. Now, that's Hollywood. I mean, if we'd known he was out on that farm, you know, we'd have gone and got him. So uh, whether that's true or not, we don't know. That was created by Hollywood. But my wife and I are watching it, and all of a sudden I start feeling sorry for the guy. I, I'm, and then it hit me. I'm like, you're feeling sorry for Pablo Escobar? You know, you need to get your head back on the straight here. But uh, so I think the Narco series did very well in, in portraying, you know, everything you see in there is not true. There's an awful lot of Hollywood. So just throw that out there right now. But um, that's – Jesse, thanks for the question. It lets us know you're you're – you're on here with, I wish you were on here with us today. Um, and that's, that's the end of the questions here. I, and we're getting close to the, to the end of time here. So I just want to say you made a statement a while ago that the United States government saved your life. Now that's not something you hear from most inmates in this country. Um, and the fact that you are our best friends now with the two guys that arrested and prosecuted you, I think that just speaks volumes to your realization of what you're, uh, errors of your ways were, I guess would be a nice way to say it. But, uh, and the fact that now you and I have become friends and, and Morgan, who's a former law enforcement officer, you know, we've all become friends as, as part of this process. I think that's a testament to the fact that American law enforcement isn't out to just, uh, roll over people and put them in prison for no reason. You know, it was a life-saving event for you. And I'm glad that they were part of it. I'm glad things have worked out for you. I'm proud of what you're doing now, Luis. You know, you and I are now friends. Uh, I appreciate Thank the opportunity. You, I appreciate the opportunity. You're, you're inviting me to to be here on this uh, uh, webinar with you today. And if you don't have anything else to say, I'll bring in uh, Christina back with us. What do you think? That's fine with me. And uh, yes, the American system did save my life. Now you have to be in the right frame of mind and do do it for yourself also i realized the minute i was arrested my old life was over you know and i i and i look forward to you know moving with my life in the right direction you that, that's got to come from you and your family has a lot to do with it and uh thanks you know i always thank god for the for the great family i have so thank excellent. you steve excellent what? What a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Thanks to both of you. And congratulations on the book, Luis. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I Christina. graduated from Our Lady of Lords Academy. So Belen oh my God. was our school. And I also went to the University of Miami. So <laughs> a lot of Belen guys. Um, a lot of Belen married guys. Married and yes. date. And, and Lords is like our sister school, is it? Uh -huh. I think Lords is our yes. sister school. It is. It is. Yeah. So beautiful school. It was interesting to hear you talk about that. And just so interesting how your life went, you know, in those directions. Just um, really, well, really fascinating life. Uh, both of you, really. That um, business never changed me. You know, uh, yeah. It, it, essentially. It essentially. Essentially. 
It was. It's, uh, that's what. That's what I find even more. It never it. changed the core. I'm, you know, I always remained the same humorous guy I've always been, and you know, I did some bad things, you know, for <laughs> the business, but um, I didn't do the uh, real nasty stuff. But I think we all have good and bad yeah. inside us, right? I mean. And this is this yeah. is a story of redemption. How yes, you know, it's this man right here went down the wrong path and came back out and look at him now. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for being with Books and Books. Thank you for supporting independent bookstores. And I wish you the best of luck. And hopefully our paths will cross in person sometime soon. Great. Thank you for being with us. To all the viewers watching, remember all you have to do is click that green button on the bottom of the screen. And you can order a copy of Pure Narco. We'll ship it right out to you um, in time for the holidays. Uh, it's a great gift. It's a great read. Um, and if you're in Miami and you want to come by one of our stores and check it out, we have it there too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Christina. Have a great Thank you, afternoon. Christina. Thanks, Thanks Steve. Bye. Okay, bye.